Thank you very much, everybody. In fact, I prepared some questions to all of you in order really to cover I mean, the topic of uh, today. But I think before really, uh, really uh, tackling the issue of healthcare and AI, let me give you an idea about the, the healthcare. And this is a question that, of course, I'm going really to use my other hat, I mean, as the former director general of Smart Capital, when they have, I mean, most of the statistics of the, of the sector, just to give you an idea, a brief idea, and, and the landscape of the healthcare. Then I would like, of course, to have an opinion of my colleague about the, about the, the sector itself. Then we will move to the impact and how AI is really uh, ch changing things. In fact, I mean, since 2019, uh, Startup Tunisia has enabled Tunisian talents to dare developing innovative uh, solutions in scalable, uh, in scalable startups. Today, reaching roughly 1,100 labels, Saifa, roughly. Uh, among, among which roughly also 260, 270 in deep tech, and more than 110 roughly on, uh, on health tech, representing around 12% of the total. These startups are roughly two to three years uh, old, and 50% of them has been really founded by men and women, providing 65% software solutions and 28% hardware solutions. 29% of them are in medical devices. A progress from 7 to 17% using AI and telemedicine 80%, AR, VR 4%, etc. The sector is hindered by several challenges such as I don't call them problems because they are every year have been really roughly solving them in a little bit. I call them, let me call them challenges such as the certification of their product, such as the labs to test their solutions, the access to data, we will get back to this point, the smallness of the market, the lack of patient investment in a sector known to be capital intensive and uh, time consuming. I guess we are blessed in Tunisia to have projects like Startup Tunisia, frankly, which is really giving at least the means to be able really to create a deep tech fund, the first, uh, South Africa, they have one, smaller one, but Tunisia is really having the one which is really dedicated, I mean, to, uh, how to say, to, to deep tech on, the, on a very, very, very early stage. So, uh, and also a program launched by Smart Capital in order really to back the SSO, the Startup Supporting Organization, to be able to accompany and to coach startups on their very early, early steps. So I'd like really to, uh, how to say, to uh, address, I mean, the questions, probably to see Heshmi. You've been, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, in the leading institutions doing, I mean, uh, uh, specialized on healthcare research. How do you see, I mean, the health sector, I mean, in Tunisia, I mean, during the last, at least these five years, during the launch of the, uh, of the, of the startup Tunisia? Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, you know the, the different pillars for, for innovation in the field of health. One of them is the academic, it is the talent, etc. I think that the system in Tunisia is good in terms of scientific production. You said that there is 12% of startup in the field of health. Uh, uh, in terms of air research and development, more than 40% of the publication and patents, etc., are in the field of health. So there is a big potential. However, the problem is the gap between the research uh, product in terms of publication, in terms of, uh, let's say, in terms of patents, and the, the innovation, and how to transform this knowledge in terms of, uh, term of product, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, services, etc. Besides the fact that there is some potential, there is some existing, uh, let's say, uh, companies and startups working in this field, there is a big potential to develop this, the field of, uh, let's say, uh, deep tech, uh, health, innovation, especially in the field of services, e-health, etc., but also in the biotech and other product that are uh, for which there is a need in Tunisia and, and, and in the world. So, 
uh, there is, uh, I, I don't want to go to the different uh, details and statistics in terms of number of research institutions. There are more than, uh, uh, in, in, in general, more than 40, 45. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, universities, uh, the last week we uh, saw the different, uh, let's say, uh, the classement uh, uh, of the yeah, ranking of the universities. Six or seven of the Tunisian universities are among the best one in the world. So there is there is a potential, but we need uh, the new, uh, let's say, the some to in to introduce at the academic level. Uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, in charge of a uh, project manager, uh, tech transfer, uh, people who are in charge of uh, intellectual property, uh, people who uh, develop business development, etc., and the connection between the academic structure that are producing a good science with the, 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 the f with the world, with the, the society, with the companies, uh, in which there is some need uh, for which there is some knowledge and potential uh, from our university. So this is the question. It's not only a matter of finance or, or, or uh, capital venture, etc. We need also the expertise. How to accompany this uh, kind of programs uh, by providing different services and expertise that could exist in Tunisia. Sometimes we have to go outside Tunisia for some specificity or some specific expertise. Thank you very much, Mr. Hisham, Dr. Uh, Hishmi. In fact, you gave us a very promising uh, percentage, which is 40 and more percent of the research has been really done in healthcare. However, today, on a, in, a, in a startup, we are seeing only 12 percent on, 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 on really health tech. Hisham, you are leading, I mean, an SSO I mean, Tunisia in health tech. How can we really move from 12 percent to 48 percent in order really that we capture all those who are really innovating, I mean, in health tech, to be able to convert them into, uh, into, into a startup. Thank you, Salaya. I think, I think we need to get back to basis. What's health tech? Uh, health tech is three subsectors. And I think each one of the subsectors has its own opportunities and uh, its own challenges also. So if you start with the, by the biotech, the biotech, I think uh, Sil Hashmi have said everything about biotech and the transition between the academic and uh, the entrepreneurial uh, I is very difficult and it's probably due to a mindset. So we need, we need to change probably the mindset of our researcher, of our students, and uh, try to think mo be beyond the article because now the mindset of a researcher is article. How, uh, how many articles must I write? Uh, what's the, art what's uh, uh, the impact factor of my article? And that's the vision that they have. And that transition needs probably a different mindset where we start thinking about patent as a first step and then thinking about transforming my patent into, into a project, into a startup, into a spin-off and so on. So we need to work on the, on the as, as everybody is saying, we need probably to work on the mindset of uh, our researcher and our students. It's not moving in fast enough, I think, according to me in Tunisia. We still have a lot to work, uh, probably in universities, although there's few things that are uh, being done now, but it's not enough. And the mindset, uh, I think we need examples and we need some success stories, and those success stories will probably uh, push our researcher and our student to change their mindset and to try uh, at least to move from the, th the academic uh, sector to the entrepreneurial sector. So that's for biotech. The second uh, sector so or subsector is the medtech, and the medtech, so the medical devices. And the medical devices in Tunisia, I think it's it's a very difficult sector due to problem of regulation, certification, uh, import of component, and so on. So it's not easy to work. That's something that we need to work on also in the medtech sector. It's not something easy in Tunisia. The third subsector is the e-health, and I think talking about artificial intelligence in the e-health sector is something that we will move to uh, artificial intelligence on that sector probably more than on the two others, although there's things to be done on the two others, but I think in Tunisia we, we need to focus on the e-health sector. Uh, we, ne uh, we need to work probably on, uh, on that transition also and on the fact that uh, we should not use uh, artif artificial intelligence as a buzzword in, uh, in the e-health sector. Uh, we need to start from relevant data and structured data 
which is really the main thing that we need to work on. And starting from that, probably working on artificial intelligence and not in the other way around. I, f I fully agree, Hisham. And I'm really curious to, to understand how AI, now as we understand really the health care sector uh, situation I mean, in Tunisia and its status, I mean, uh, thank you very much, Hisham, that you gave, I mean, the, how to say, the different sectors, subsectors, let's say, and the difficulty of really backing them. How AI technology really uh, can bridge healthcare access gaps? Yes. Ghazi. Absolutely. You've thank been you. really involved as a, as a coach, as a, how to say, a mentor, uh, helping, I mean, the startups really to manage and to structure their startup using AI. Absolutely. Give us, I mean, your, your, your opinion on, yes. on that. Yes, and I mean, um, I could say basically while roaming around, the word basically I've seen of all colors at some point even very surprising usages one important thing to understand in a sense is that um, adding to what uh, the, the Dr. Bozier and Hisham said is that also health tech is um, eventually a sector that's also involving some new kind of uh, business software in a sense mm -hmm. the kind of software that's usually like kind of improves the lives of doctors <laughs> in order to operate in a better way. Mm -hmm. And these kind of solutions are actually local in Tunis are pretty much taking the lead when I see most of the health techs, like I mean, the tendency of early stage startups at least. Because eventually um, the applications of AI at least, how I see three big technologies actually leveraging this. I see con lots of uh, computer vision in a sense and which basically shows in lots of tools in diag diagnostic which is basically like goes from visual to microscopic vision and developing models based on patterns. There is a lot as well of machi machine learning in a sense, especially when it comes to statistics. There is uh, some usage that looks obvious and hidden at the same time. That's, uh, there are many applications of AI as well in epidem epidemiology, which is not necessarily like in the, me the direct medical practice, but it comes more of a statistic practice at the same time. Uh, where pe people are basically like using that to develop patterns. But um, the combination of all of these technologies at some point is developing new technologies and new solutions. And at the same time, um, coming back to the business software between brackets part, what I realized is due to some obstacles when it comes, for example, to authorizations, to avail availability of data. Let's face it, when, when you're developing an AI, sometimes you need data that you don't have immediately or that involves actually an active process of testing around people eventually, which is not necessarily permitted or for some ethical constraints, it's not the case. So most of the solutions are actually driving in a sense to make it easy to do teleconsultations or sometimes patient triage or sometimes even organizing the operations in a hospital, or even when it comes to stock and it comes to procurement, it comes to all that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a mix of many technologies at the same time in different usages. I mean, I could see this as a very horizontal um, integration in uh, the way actual medical practice is happening. And um, it's very important to understand that um, what health tech, as a, as, um, call it as, a, as a trend, when it came to startups, it attracted in the same time doctors who wanted to create some kind of business or some people are in the medical space, but sometimes it attracted also businessmen. So it kind of created in some countries the wave of, you know, health as a business, which is not necessarily the reality of every economy. In some countries like ours, the medical practice is still heavily regulated. We try to make sure we don't push many competitive <laughs> practices. We try to make sure we protect all of that. And this is part of what's affecting also like the pace and the kind of activities that we can do in some startups. So all these technologies and their applications um, today come in all shapes and forms <laughs> and we're finding new interesting combinations that sometimes do not necessarily come from the research perspective, but more from business optimization perspective. For example, like I took the triage of patients part, which essentially can, act, can actually impact in a considerable way, a way that the hospital treats their conditions, their patients and all of that. And for some reason, these are also considered health techs <laughs> because in the end, their systemic impact is making sure that doctors actually operate on easier conditions on some cases or they have a predictive, for example, um, view of stocks or view of uh, many things. But I could go to the cutting edge technology as well where basically like and I met a startup somewhere in the US where basically they're using compu computer vision to predict heart failure in a sense. 
So, um, and I'm talking about prediction in, in, in a sense, so they could see basically patterns and it's a diagnostic tool that could say even at which time you can expect to a certain level of a currency, of course. But that's one example of many, I mean, focusing on technologies. Thank you very much, Ghazi. You gave some example extremely uh, relevant and even uh, promising. But I mean, not, no, as, we, as we said, I mean, as you've been really explaining, I mean, the sector is so, uh, uh, I mean, there is a lot of variety of things, yes. variety of services, but I, uh, Hisham, I'd like really to get back to you. I mean, you, you, you are a structure, of course, certainly, backed by uh, experts who are really helping you also to uh, coach or to mentor, I mean, startups. How you can handle, I mean, or how you are really handling today uh, startups who are really willing to add another layer of AI and, uh, you know, of course, your, one of your role is to help them really get labeled or also raise funds. So how you're really doing it in order really that they will empower their solution with AI? Thank you, Sarai. Uh, I think, I think it's, not, it's not a simple thing, especially in Tunisia. I need, uh, we need to work on the, the complete ecosystem because there's regulation. We need to work on the regulation side. We need to work on the ethics side, and that's still something that we need to work on in Tunisia. Uh, there's the funding part. We have already some uh, investment funds, but that's not enough yet because AI, health tech, in the health tech sector mainly, uh, is very consuming, very fund consuming. I mean, we need a lot of money in order to address uh, tho those kind of uh, projects. Yes. Uh, the networking, as you said in the beginning, the market is very small in Tunisia. So when we work on AI, generally we work on international markets and we need a network, we need markets ac market access uh, to, uh, to international market and that's, that's something very easy. So that's, that's more the, the pillar that we need to work on in order to address every, every startup in the health tech sector, not only AI, but every startup in the health tech sector needs at least those things and we need to address the network issues also as experts because we still have uh, lack of expertise in Tunisia, although we start to have some, but we are still uh, lacking of expertise, maybe both on both sides, health tech and AI in the same time, or AI uh, on one side and health tech on the other side. So it's too, uh, something very, very, uh, very specific that needs expertise that we do not still have in Tunisia easily. Thank you. By hearing you and Ghazi, of course, I, I'm curious really to understand another thing. Now it's about the challenges. What are the challenges facing the AI adoption? I mean, data, infrastructures, talent, all these are things that we have really to consider. Really, So uh, probably uh, let me give the floor to uh, Khulud and, uh, and Ahmed. I mean, they are entrepreneurs. So they are really living, I mean, the, the issue of the challenge, I, I imagine. So Khulud and Ahmed, what are really the challenges that you encountered, I mean, by the... Uh, by, the, by, the, by your startups to leverage and add, as I said to Hisham, a layer to empower I mean, your solution with AI? Uh, so for us, uh, the biggest challenge today is the integration uh, with experts workflow. Uh, as uh, building an AI today is uh, very challenging uh, for experts, uh, so we have to, uh, pu to consider that the AI will not replace the expert, rather than it will be like uh, it complements them. Uh, building an AI also, you have to think about non-invasive solutions. And the second uh, challenge uh, today, we have the data security, data privacy and security. So for us dealing with the skin uh, health uh, data, uh, especially the ones related to medical purpose, uh, 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 to medical purpose involves uh, a strict regularity compliance. We have like GDPR, and we have to consider uh, that while dealing with this sensitive uh, data, and we have to ensure data privacy, the storage of uh, data, and uh, encryption. And uh, to do this, uh, to do this, uh, it makes the complexity and the integration of AI uh, more uh, like uh, uh, higher. 
Uh, also, we have to build the trust uh, with users and experts while, d while using data, especially the, da the data based on prediction of problems. Uh, we're talking about uh, medical problems, uh, skin problems. Uh, we have to build the trust with uh, users and with experts uh, with data-driven solutions. Uh, because today we have uh, the personalized uh, personalized data uh, data solutions, so we have to make sure that uh, the data sets we are collecting already, we have to make sure of the of the reliability of the information. Uh, also, we have to to uh, we have to build the conscience with uh, with users that this data will help them uh, either to track their, for example, skin metrics or health metrics in general. And for experts, uh, we, we have the biggest challenge today is to, to, to offer this solution as a, complement, uh, as a complementary, not, to, not for them to think it's something that's replacing them and to create more personalized uh, skincare solutions. Thank you. Oh. So from my part, I will try to be more into the technical side, because as a startup, as you mentioned, Sealaya, uh, there is the data availability issues, there is the infrastructure issues, there is the shortage of the talent. So in our case, uh, we've been struggling with all of this. So the data availability for us to work on, for example, um, breast images or um, skin uh, images, which is not really that available, uh, you have to generate your own uh, data and you have to generate high quality data, so we are talking about synthetic data. Uh, that's one of the um, paths that we took in order to deal with this issue. Uh, the infrastructure now, if we are talking about hospitals, that they are lacking high quality of infra infrastructure where we can pump the data, get the data, the high quality data that we're gonna use later on to make um, high quality uh, AI models capable of doing incredible things. Uh, this is the thing that I guess we have to, as key makers, as uh, institution, uh, as a uh, government, we have to think about those uh, um, infrastructure issues to tackle those. Uh, so our future um, in hospitals and clinics, etc., could be uh, fruitful, I would say, in the next uh, for the next generation, for the next years. Uh, finally, it's the talent lake uh, in two parts. So there is the um, AI experts that they are leaving uh, for uh, better opportunities uh, uh, overseas, let's say going to Europe for better uh, opportunities. Uh, so it's uh, for us as t uh, as a AI uh, startup, we are dealing with this shortage of uh, startups uh, of uh, AI uh, experts. And the good thing is that Tunisia is bringing a lot of high quality human resources. So that's not something that I'm going to talk about. That you know all of uh, all of you know about it, but. It's still, uh, we have to think about maintaining those uh, high quality resources. Same goes for the medical staffing. Uh, they are also trying to move aboard. So if you are trying also to maintain uh, those, um, those talents in Tunisia, it's gonna be really interesting for the prosperity of uh, uh, the AI into the healthcare uh, industry. Thank you very much. Uh, Ahmed uh, Ghazi, I'd like really to get back to you. You've been really, uh, we've spoken of, and you said that <coughs> you have a lot of to say, I mean, about data infrastructure and talent, and you've been really leaving some challenges. Please tell us, I mean, how you feel it and how you also you think to be a, to solve I mean, this kind of thing in order to help Khulud and Ahmed really, I mean, going forward I mean, the, on, their, on their adventure. Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, in the end, I think, um, I think developing healthcare, health tech startups in general is the work of a whole ecosystem that kinds of works together. I, I think it's a result of very clear policies when it comes particularly to the part of data. I mean, I just want to take a clear statement between brackets. And I think many of uh, many of people who intervene, at least in the health space or the decision space in general, or even the technology space in general, fail to understand basically um, how AI works. I mean, if I, go, if I might go a bit technical and try to summarize it a bit, if you're trying to code, we're basically creating a set of ro uh, like of set of rules, and we're feeding data, and it gives an, an output. But basically, when we're building an AI, it works differently. We don't develop rules. We basically create models, <laughs> and we feed them data, and we hope it creates rules for us. 
See what I mean? So data is basically, um, data for an AI product is what fuel is for a car. <laughs> it's that mandatory. And the sizes of data, depending on the ambition of the project, can actually be like a game changer. Like I know a startup who basically worked on a different topic. It's more of a la large language model. I assure you, they were rendering five petabytes of data. <laughs> You can imagine the size of that. And uh, believe me, it's a very conservative number to other projects. So what I'm, I mean, look at OpenAI, I wouldn't even imagine the size of the data you're using right now. All that I'm saying in a sense is that um, developing breakthroughs through AI demands lots of risks that need to be taken sometimes. And it makes sense to see that there are always ethical applications or any discussions in this, but I think there needs a lots of clarification, for example. I mean, let me give you one clear example. If we try to collaborate, for example, with university uh, setups or, uh, I don't know, for example, or uh, any government folks, basically, we unfortunately lack a very clear framework of acquiring and using data, that data that is structured, that is clear, and that's usable. And by saying this statement, it's not necessarily putting it, uh, the blame in one of the parties, because eventually it's about having a clear framework in the first place that comes with a clear process for a startup and with the right reservations taken into consideration on the other side. And it's highly important to at least develop a collective reflection on this. What could be a good ambition actually to work on is eventually try to make sure the framework is clear on that end. And it could be even like structured by discipline or stuff like that. And I, of course, I take uh, clear consideration that I'm thinking about very specific cases in science for at least for this right now. Um, same thing, I think um, when it comes to um, reviewing also like the way things work when um, we try to make touch points with some structural solutions, I mean, let's say, um, many solutions are actually built based on APIs. Mm -hmm. And APIs today don't find necessarily the right tech infrastructure to in integrate upon. So basically you're trying to make a change on a structure, an infrastructure, on a tech infrastructure that's actually old enough to not work. So sometimes we need to look exactly where the work is. And all beyond on that, there's a high important uh, cultural thing also to discuss. Because sometimes, like after years in practice, we need to make sure to consider elements. Thank you very much, Ghazi. In fact, I'm going really to make the relay. I mean, w when, it con when uh, data are considered, essentially for healthcare, most of the people are, c are considering, I mean, the confidentiality and the privacy. And I imagine this is what you mean by cultural, uh, by cultural, I think, some sense. Probably I will ask the question to uh, Dr. Heshmi. I mean, you've been in a, in a, in a public institution, which is also extremely caring <coughs> about the issue. What the Tunisian government has really been done in order really to make access to, to data accessible? Really a difficult question. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, access of, of data, especially health data, is, is a big challenge, I think, for the promotion and the development of technology around, uh, around health. This is something very, very important in which we have to work. Uh, personal data, uh, ethical aspects, uh, deontology sometimes, so uh, we, and it's, it's extremely important to use the available data. There is many data, many, many files, many information. I remember uh, during my life at Institute Pasteur, the number of, of uh, uh, dire, database for different disease, etc. Uh, it, it's very helpful in order to, to, to find solution for some question linked to health, etc., for product. But we have to uh, clarify and we have to um, found a good uh, regulation uh, how to use the data, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et you can sell the data. You know, there is some companies in the world that give you some data. You have to pay for obtaining data that help you to develop product, to develop information, to develop many services. So data, especially on health, is something challenging, and I hope that uh, we realize this in, in our country, because we have good data, good data. We have a good, uh, let's say, level of, of the quality of, of the medical doctor in Tunisia. There are uh, 
attracting in some places in Europe now, etc. There is some real potential if we have good data and good use of the data. It could generate many, many, uh, let's say, information that impact uh, the, the development, impact the wealth creation, uh, etc. So among the, the, the aspects linked to data availability also, we have to put uh, many regulatory uh, and legal aspects, um, privacy, uh, ethical, as I told you. So uh, data is the, the in the heart of the development of uh, biotech, of uh, health uh, uh, innovation, etc. This is extremely, extremely important and there is uh, many things to do uh, from the uh, field of the, the uh, government, of the regulators, and also the availability of data will generate many, many projects and the many, uh, let's say, uh, programs uh, that uh, is uh, in, in the heart uh, of uh, the development uh, and biotech development as one of the factors of development of the country. I don't know if I answer your question. But what I was expecting to, to receive as an answer is that, okay, I fully agree with that, but for the uh, regulatory uh, aspects and for the ethics aspects, is there any, how to say, uh, entity I mean, in, in Tunisia which is really handling I mean, this, uh, this, this issue or it is left, left to whoever is really willing to use data, use data and that's it? even if it, uh, when it is anonymous? In fact, when data are anonymous, it could be used, of course, by and uh, used for, yeah. But uh, in Tunisia, because you ask about ethical aspect, we have uh, 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 one committee. Uh, it's a committee d'éthique médicale. There is ethical committee, uh, ethic committee, so he's in charge of this kind of uh, information of data, etc. But we have to uh, inform and to, uh, let's say, uh, make more uh, uh, fluidification of the system uh, in order first to make data important and can help the scientific development and uh, development of startups and biotech, etc. In the other side, without, let's say, uh, affecting the confidentiality affecting uh, the personal data, etc. So we have to find this, uh, let's say, this uh, compromise uh, and in order to first promote uh, the development of tech in the field of health because it's very sensible comparing to other uh, technologies, but also uh, uh, it's important to do this uh, and to respect, of course, uh, personal data. Thank you very much, Dr. Heshmi. In fact, I, at the beginning, I said that uh, in the, uh, when presenting the health, sec health sector in Tunisia, I said that 65% mostly of the health care or health tech startups are uh, using soft, essentially in the soft. This has been confirmed by Hisham. I mean, he said that an e-health in general, which is almost very, very close, uh, most of the, uh, 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 how to say, the coaching or mentoring is done for those we consider it as a low-hanging fruit. I mean, essentially, I mean, the, in the field of uh, diagnostics. And my question, uh, the last one, uh, is uh, what will be the role, I'd like really to listen to all of you, I mean, what will be the, really the role of AI in enhancing diagnostic accuracy? In enhancing diagnostic uh, accuracy. But I'd like also to, I, write, I made some, some <laughs> research. What is, has been reported uh, is that diagnostic errors, listen to that, are a significant challenge in uh, healthcare, leading to unnecessary treatments, increased costs, and even patient harm. AI has the potential to revolutionize diagnostics by improving accuracy and speed. Machine learning algorithms can analyze today medical images, lab results, and other data to detect diseases such as cancer, heart disease, and neurological disorder with the remarkable precision human eye cannot detect. I'd like really to hear you about these uh, diagnostics. Most of the startup in Tunisia are really working 
on e-health or something related also to diagnostics. So uh, I'd like to give you the floor. Whoever is ready to, to, to answer, go ahead. I mean, of Very quickly. Yeah, uh, of course. Wasim is telling me that we are running out of time. Yes. So please, I mean, one minute maximum. Yeah, yeah sure thing. So, so eventually when we're talking about the ability of AI in diagnostics, we're basically talking about taking some kind of any kind of data essentially and trying to make sense out of it. AI has basically developed a very, cap like a huge capacity to develop a certain speedy operation in a sense that they can like do a very fast treatment. Eventually like th this clearly has, ha is gonna have a huge role, but at some point it's also like a mid to long term investment. If we try to in invest in AI right now and try to make sure that everything changes right now, it does, I don't feel it works that way because AI models develop accuracy, uh, accuracy all along the time, exactly, it's a progressive thing. And it's highly important to understand that because AI in a sense is basically composed of many technologies right now coming like either from like doing machine learning on the level of computer vision from uh, like from uh, language models as well. W language models actually has a very surprising use today. I mean, I will just try to make you imagine one quick situation. A doctor sits with a patient. They are you can have two types of patients. A patient who actually understands a part of his condition that takes more understanding to it from the doctor, and the patient who actually has no idea what's happening with him. And sometimes this is actually dependent on the level of education of some people, right? Some LLMs today are actually remediating that by simply making the patient more aware by the time he sits with the doctor and more understanding of his situation. So just imagine how this can optimize the way doctors actually operate and deliver basically like the, the needed value to their own patients. Excellent, Ghazi, good point, good point. Ahmed. So I'm gonna talk about improving the uh, diagnosis tools like uh, there is an initiative uh, been, uh, between uh, a, a startup called Deep Tech and um, Abdurrahman Mami uh, Hospitals where they've been working together on um, lung diseases uh, such as uh, tuberculosis and COVID, which is, uh, as you can see, it's increasing the efficiency of uh, diagnosis and helps the decision makers. So that was really interesting things. Other uh, solution like deep learning, um, deep learning solution for applied on X-ray imaging also increased the quality of uh, diagnosis, which is really interesting, as I said from the beginning, uh, taking decision, which is really key making. But uh, there is the reducing of human error that you mentioned, Sealaya, before. Uh, if you are trying to integrate in our uh, inf infrastructure, in hospitals, etc., cetera, um, a medical history tools that are also combined with the medication checker, and it's gonna be like 360 uh, vision uh, that helps the medical staff, like uh, pharmacists, uh, doctors, uh, and medical staff, taking the right decision because they have a better view of the patient uh, let's say, uh, landscape, existing on the landscape of uh, the, the medical issues, et cetera. So those are uh, the, the things that helps in terms of accuracy, uh, in, in terms of uh, diagnosis uh, accuracy. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Khulud? Uh, so for us, dealing with the skin uh, health data, we want to, uh, to ensure uh, the data accuracy and uh, that the data is ethic in order to develop a personalized solution and AI-driven solution, uh, we are working on uh, on delivering like algorithm algorithms who gonna predict uh, future skin problems, in order to help users to take the right decisions in the right time. Because often uh, people they don't know whether to consult or not, or just get uh, products. And for experts, we are working to deliver uh, to deliver AI-driven solution in order, for example, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, and for uh, for users to for patients to is for example post-surgical aesthetic uh, operations. It's very important today uh, to help uh, patients take the right decision before undergoing any uh, surgical solutions. Thank you, uh, Hisham Silhashmi. In fact, uh, I, I think that artificial intelligence now it's, it plays a very important role on enhancing diagnostics uh, in, in, the in general. I, I have some example for the medical imaging. Now there is a use of artificial intelligence uh, for the analysis of some subtleties, some subtle uh, 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 information 
uh, that are uh, uh, usually uh, not seen by the expert. But uh, so this is extremely important. Also, uh, the precision medicine. There is some, some, some uh, advancement in this field. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the clinical decision support. Uh, now we use more and more uh, artificial intelligence again uh, for that and also in pathology. So there is a big field. I know that there is some uh, people and groups who work on this, uh, on this and they are uh, making some results and it, it's, it's very, very important. And we hope that we uh, will be able to integrate uh, all this new field, let's say, of application of artificial intelligence in the field of diagnosis in general. I'm probably going to say something very, very strange at the end of this, uh, this panel. Uh, if there's a takeaway, don't work on AI. Work on data, and AI will follow. And that's the problem I think we have. We are working, a lot of startups are working on uh, data sets of European uh, health tech patients, on uh, uh, North, Af North American uh, uh, patients, and so on. And the result of the diagnostics, based on that, what the AI will give as a diagnostic will probably not be uh, sufficient enough in Africa or in North Africa. So we need to work on our data. We have data in Africa and North Africa that is very important to, uh, to look at differently. So if there's a startup who tries to work on AI today, work on how to digitalize the, the information, the healthcare information in North Africa, in Africa, and then work on AI on that data in order to, to have a, a serious diagnostics which is applicable to our African uh, countries and to our African North, North countries. So let's start by data and then the AI will follow, I think. So I would leave it with the floor to everybody to just take away because I like the idea. I'm finalizing by recommendation. So great. Yes, any take away? No, I, I, I just so want... Yeah, I, I want to confirm what uh, was said now. Uh, it's extremely important. For example, fever in some country, you have to think on malaria because it's the most frequent pathology. And in other places, it could be something other. This is something very important for medicine in order to take decision, etc. is the environment, is the, the specificities. And I ag completely agree with the fact that we need to have our specific data and data that are linked to the environment uh, of the people uh, and also uh, in general, even uh, d data on, on the environment of animals uh, and uh, uh, one health, etc. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hashmi, uh, Ghazi, and then Khulu Deir Ahmed. Yes. Uh, Takeaway, recommendation yes. for uh, our African friends. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Tunisian one, of course. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, no, and I think it's an everywhere problem sometimes. I think it's very important to understand that uh, data comes as a priority, as Hisham mentioned, essentially, because AI without data is not even like operating on the right sense. And it's highly important to understand that um, in the end, I think it's a global policy reflection and problem. Policy, in a sense, should involve all the stakeholders. I think it's about understanding under which laws you are already operating. Some laws already can allow you to access part of the data, but not all of it. But you need to understand what are the laws in place, what are the mechanisms in, pla uh, in place. We need to have the right dialogue with the right people, and we need to understand which institutions are there when it comes to ethics, when it comes to current practice, when it comes to actual like you know orders and collectives, and have the conversation together. Because in the end, I believe that each stakeholder in this equation has a valid point, and the idea is to harmonize them and find the common ground. Because in the end, you can uh, we can definitely find a way to gather medical data that is sensitive, but without, for example, compromising privacy of people and stuff. But this requires mechanisms, and this requires a clear way to regulate the thing. And of course, I advise startups to document a lot on this because you are the winning party in the end of this adventure and this equation. So it's highly important to take the initiatives on our end and as an ecosystem as well, trying to, 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 ta to take this move. Thank you very much, Ghazi. Ahmed? Uh, from my side, I'm trying to be, I would say, a little bit positive. Um, since I've been listening to all of you uh, talking about how can we push 
much further how can you improve things which is the good mentality i would say so far i've been in several co countries i realized like the quality of the uh, output that we are providing us tunisian startups is high quality and if you are having this mindset of pushing the boundaries and trying to make much better uh, impacts either in tunisia or africa or as a um, humankind because we are dealing with um, the um, the healthcare, so it's, it affects everyone. So uh, I would say for everyone, uh, try to, to to push the limits, yeah, and uh, be also um, know also that uh, we are doing something really good, and we we need to to push the boundaries. Uh, so. Um I, uh, for me, for example, in my experience in Tunisia launching a startup, I, I am so glad to be part of Startup Act because uh, they uh, because they provide the the necessary uh, the necessary support uh, for every young entrepreneur to go th through this uh, adventure. And uh, for us, uh, in launching a startup in skin health and well-being, the most uh, important thing today, as mentioned, is the uh, is to build the trust with the users. So, for data storage and data collection, we have to be very careful uh, because we are uh, because we have to be responsible in the in the data uh, in, in the AI-driven solution that we are providing. You can't just collect data or use uh, accessible data, uh, open sources data. Uh, as mentioned, for example, you can't use European, uh, European skin uh, data and you deliver to, uh, to develop an algorithm which uh, which going to target uh, people in Africa or North Africa so th that it wouldn't, it, uh, it wouldn't be like uh, accurate or, or trustworthy. So, uh, yeah, I would say we have to focus on data uh, rather, than, uh, rather, uh, rather than developing an AI directly. We have to focus on data storage, uh, data privacy, uh, also to be ethic and uh, to build the trust, worth, uh, the trust. To build the trust is the most important thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much, Khulud. I don't know, we seem if we have still uh, time to... Leave the floor to the uh, to the participants. Let's to see ask if there is a question. One or two questions. Questions. No questions. One or two questions. No. No questions. Okay. Please go ahead. Yes. 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 Okay, so you were talking about digitizing the African he health data. So my question is about the sub-Saharan Africa. The, um, the infrastructure isn't really there. And how do you think we can digitize it? Because uh, let's say we are thinking about building a product that will make it easy to have the health data of the people in sub-Saharan Africa. But how do you think we can implement that? with this the poor infrastructure that we have over there. Who's the Go ahead. Raziz, Raziz, go ahead. I mean it's clearly a problem, right? I mean I, I, I would not pretend that it's gonna this is something that's gonna be solved overnight. In the end, we basically are living also with digital infrastructure challenges on every ecosystem in a different way. I'm not saying this is an, an, an this is not a solvable problem. But this is actually why I put the emphasis on a policy reflection in a sense, because policies basically exist in systems on the developments. You just showed us exactly how the digital, like let's say, readiness of certain ecosystems can impact health tech. See what I mean? But sometimes it's about just connecting the dots. Some businesses can be actually operate into providing the right infrastructure for uh, some, proc like for example, proxy regions or TAF ecosystems, but some others can basically plug the data collection points, or for example, the mechanisms, the mechanisms to collect data, or some businesses other uh, even democratize access to, you know, for example, to medical care, and the combination of all three can be an actual solution in a sense. And this is exactly what I'm saying. And I think Hishem has a, a good point when he says in the end, the reflection is not about building a ready tool that is AI, 
uh, to just focusing there, well, sometimes you need actually the means, the right infrastructure and everything. And what I'm continuing to say on this, um, he says data is an important mean to do that. I'm, I'm saying other relevant startups actually reinforcing the infrastructure itself are also important in this equation. I mean, you need a, b a bit of everything to build the world, right? And um, yeah, this is exactly what I'm putting here on the table. Thank you very much. Very okay. last question. Any, any other question? Otherwise, we'll... Uh, okay, go ahead. Thank please, you. please, please. Thank you very much. It's been very enriching listening to uh, all the panelists today from across the spectrum. Um, so I wanted to know, uh, respect, respectively, how has the Tunisian government has been very supportive in uh, harnessing the potential of AI um, from your perspective, either from a academic perspective or in the entrepreneurship ecosystem so that other governments uh, across the continent can emulate uh, if it is a model, if you believe that it is a role model in uh, basically helping all the startup ecosystem flourish here in Tunisia. Thank you very much. And Pro that can be for yeah. each one of you. Thank you. Prob probably I can't really answer it. I will put him in the hat of uh, the former Director General of Smart Capital. In fact, the government put at the beginning I mean, the, the appropriate infrastructure to make I mean, the this, this startup uh, create, create it and grow. Yes. That means he put I mean, a startup act to be able first to identify those who dare developing I mean, innovative and scalable solution through this startup act, which is really giving I mean, a package of 22 incentives to both the entrepreneur to the uh, investor and to the startup. So this will help emulate and uh, encourage whoever is really having a talent and the ability to create a solution, to dare create the solution, to go out from his garage and create the solution because he needs really to have these incentives. And the government, it's not only the question of incentives. For the government, it's a question to, is to know who can do, who can really create solutions in order that we will give him the incentives and, of course, we will back him by the funding in order that he will create a startup. And we have many examples. InstaDeep, Expensia, uh, Next Protein, many, many startups in Tunisia today, they are really growing. I mean, six years ago, nobody knew them, including InstaDeep. Nobody, I mean, heard about InstaDeep in 2016 or 17. You know? So this is one. Second, he knew that we cannot really, really leave them on their own after being labelized. So we give them all the support, like SSOs, you know, supports the startup supporting organization. We back them by money in order that they will create program. You mentioned AI. We are encouraging SSOs, incubator, accelerator, startup studio, to create program to enable the startups to be able to empower their solution with AI. So we bring experts, we give money in order that they can also have the appropriate tools to be able to really to coach startups and really to grow in order that they will have that layer of AI. We encourage them really to have an incubator for women, incubator in a remote area, etc., in order really to create, I mean, the ecosystem in which the startup really can grow, can really go its step by step in order that they will reach the, 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 the venture, the VC fund. And the third pillar, which is extremely important, is the fund of fund. So the government thought about the fund of fund in order that all these label startup, after really moving through the SSOs, and they became ready really to knock on the door of the, of the, of the VC fund, they will find the fund. So we create a fund of fund, label, I mean, label it in euro, in order really to give money to this startup to be able really to grow even locally or internationally in all the stages, the seed, early and late. You know, so this is extremely important. Now, what would government did, I mean, for the AI? Of course, I mean, the government is really very, very open and we are, he's observing through smart capital, through CDC, all these uh, government institutions, they are really observing what's really happening, I mean, the, in the uh, startup ecosystem. And of course, trying really to find the appropriate partner in order really to do the right coaching and mentoring and backing for the startup in order to grow. So today, I mean, I mentioned, of course, the, that the government is really encouraging very much 
Pristini to grow, other, company, other universities, I mean, to develop AI-backed research, master degree, etc., to have also experts internationally come to Tunisia to back this, etc. So these kind of things are extremely uh, important that the government is really backing. But our side, we would like really to create more and more incubator accelerator mm -hmm. dedicated and specialized in AI. And on all, uh, in all respects, yes, ed tech, feed tech, agri tech, I strongly believe when I was in the, the, the director general of Smart Capital to include AI in everything. Health tech, ed tech, fintech, uh, uh, all the tech should be really empowered by AI. You know? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.